Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you through a time lapse version how I painted this Cocker Spaniel in acrylics. Now this has been the only pet portrait that I can remember where I've started off with the nose first. And the reason being was I couldn't actually see the eyes on Archie here. Because he had a really impressive uh, loads of thick curls on the top of his head, you couldn't see his eyes. And normally that's where I would start with any portrait that I'm working on. But the main feature that you see when you looked at the reference photo was his nose and that's the reason why for this painting I started there. Now when I work on noses, regardless of the medium, I always usually map in the nostrils first. That's because if you get the placement of the nostrils slightly wrong, it will change the complete look of that nose. So it's really important that you've got your first few reference points in place and then you can map around the nostrils from there, building up depth. Now I like working from light to dark and that's exactly what I'm doing here with the fur as well. Now with acrylics, when we're working on the surfaces that we do with this medium, you haven't got to worry about filling the tooth of the paper. So you can work from dark to light and with other mediums, when I'm working with lighter fur like the white markings on the face here, I usually put a lighter base layer down. But with acrylics here, that really doesn't matter. So you can work from dark to light, which is usually the best way of building depth. So what I tend to do is I'm not focusing on the details at the very top of the fur that you see when you look at the reference photo first. I'm painting in at the moment the fur that would be closest to the skin and then I'm going to build up the fur from there. And you can see that even at this base layer stage I am following and paying attention to the direction of the fur and the way that it travels. That is really, really important. It is going to then really reflect what that animal looks like. If you get that fur direction slightly wrong, it's going to impact the whole structure of that animal. And I talk about this a lot in the last video that I uploaded here to YouTube, and that is the top tips for drawing fur. Now, although that focused on pastels with the clips there, it would also be exactly the same with how I tackle and work with acrylics. The only difference is, as I've mentioned, is tip six, and that was your contrast about working from light to dark with your lighter coated breeds. Whereas with something like this, with acrylics, it really doesn't matter. So tip six, you can work from dark to light regardless of the color that you're working on. Now a big tip when you are painting anything to do with fur here, it's really important that you do use a variety of brushes. Now the reason being, if you use the same brush for your very first base layer all the way up to your final details, all of your brush strokes are gonna be the same. The fur is then gonna be flat and it's not gonna have the same amount of depth you want the different textures of the fur to shine through. So for instance, the fur that I'm working on at the moment on the top of Archie's head, that is considerably longer than the fur on the bridge of the nose. So it's important to really study that reference photo and see where the brush needs to be slightly longer in the strokes and where you need to then shorten them back up. It's all gonna vary depending on the breed that you're working on. But you'll also see here that I've switched over to more of my detailed brush, the more higher up in the layers that I'm building. So as that fur starts to get closer to the viewer and the fur that you would touch if you were to stroke Archie, that needs to be left until the very end and I'd be using more of my finer detailed brushes like this one that I'm working on here for those last layers. However, you can still see some of the larger, thicker layers from the very first base layer and the refinement layer that I was adding in. Each additional layer that you add, you don't want to be trying to completely cover that previous layer. We want those details to show through. That is what's going to build up depth in your painting. Something that I speak about in my Patreon tutorials is how I strip back in, into small sections and then I work on individual layers. And this area on the top of the head is a prime example with something that would be really complex to tackle. It's one of those elements where you would look at it and you think, where do I start? Because you've got a lot of the, the clumps of the fur that are overlapping, they're all interweaved with another. It's really quite daunting. But what I do is I break it down into a, that one small area. I'm only focusing on the white tuft of fur to start with, and then I strip it into individual layers. I do imagine what it would be at the furthest away further away from the viewer, closest to the skin, and then I do build up from there, I do find that a lot easier into tackling specific elements, especially if it's something that you know is going to be particularly challenging. Now when you are working on a fur type like this, it's really important to just go for close. If you're trying to just go for photorealism rather than hyperrealism, you don't have to make sure that every single individual fur stroke is in exactly the right place. 
Photorealism is what I aim to do and that's where you look at my painting, you look back at the artwork and you can tell that it was that photo that I worked from but you can still see that my painting is a painting. Hyperrealism is where you've got the artwork and the reference photo side by side and you can't tell the difference. You'd have to work considerably larger in order to achieve that and spend far longer on each piece. Now I have so much respect for people that do what the hyperrealistic work but for me I find I would get bored spending that much time on one piece. I like to have a few projects on my mind at one time. I already start thinking what I want to be painting next when I'm three quarters of the way through a current piece. So for me, photorealism is always what I've aimed to achieve in my work. So I'm not making sure that every individual first strand is in exactly the same place, but I am making sure that it's close. You want to look at that photo and really go for it as close as you possibly can, as I've said, but don't stress yourself out that every little fur detail is a few millimetres not in the right position because it's not going to make any difference to the finished piece. You just want to make sure that you've got your contrast right, so you've got the white fur as bright as it needs to be and the darker fur here as dark as it needs to be and then the rest will follow on from there. Contrast really is so important and I do speak about it a lot in all of my tutorials both here and on Patreon. Now although when I say that I'm not focusing on all of the details being in exactly the right place compared to the reference photo, in terms of the main features like the eyes, the nose, you know, the outline, my initial sketch, I make sure that that is as accurate to that reference photo as I possibly can because you want to make sure that your perspective and your proportions are correct. Now if you make sure that they are right from the very beginning it's going to make your life a lot easier throughout the painting process because you know what you're working from from the very beginning is already accurate to that reference photo. Now the fur here that I'm working on for example I'm making sure that I painted my base layers in first and then all of the clumps of the curls of fur on top I've painted on separately. I'm then starting to map in my highlights and then my shadows and I'm building the depth in between each clump of fur. On this one section, because it is quite challenging, I broke it down into one small area and then I took each curl individually, just to make sure that I was paying attention to as much of the depth there as I possibly can. I needed this texture here to be realistic, I wanted it to look like it was really thick fur here, so I had to make sure that my base layers and the refinement layers after that were well established. Now the details that I then add here with a liner brush are left until the very end. These finer, wispier details you want to make sure are your last layers because they overlap everything else. And what I'm doing here is applying a darker glaze to certain areas to help push back certain parts of the curls. That's going to help create more depth, but you'll see here that I do go back in with my liner brush and add some more of those finer, lighter details on top. That's going to really help to build up more depth because those kinds of details will overlap everything else, just like the whiskers. You need to leave them till the very end because otherwise we'll end up having to paint around them. That will take us far longer to complete that painting. So although the whiskers make such a difference to the overall piece, it really does help to leave them to the very last layer. Now one of the most common questions that I'm asked is about glazing and do I use glazing mediums? Now for me, I do just like to glaze with water, so I will thin down my Liquitex Basics, which is the paint that I like to use, I will thin it down and then I will use that as a glaze to adjust the colour if I need to. Now that's why I like using Liquitex Basics, because they have a lot of colours in the range and some of the colours are more transparent than others. So they do naturally work very well with glazes and all you have to do is use water. Now of course if glazing medium is your preference that is absolutely fine but for me I find just thinning them with water does the job. So just like with the top of the head the details that I'm adding here I'm using my liner brush and I'm working from dark to light each additional layer that I'm adding here you'll see gets slightly lighter. Now using the liner brush is one of those brushes where it really does help to get a bit of practice with it before you start painting with it on your pet portraits. So what you can do is use a scrap bit of watercolour paper and just use some cheap paints and just get used to creating really fine lines, some shorter fine lines and then longer lines like when you need to paint some whiskers and do that on a spare scrap bit of paper to start with. You don't have to do that experimenting and practising on canvases, a watercolour paper will work just fine. But taking the time to get confident using a liner brush will really take your artwork and your fine details, how much realism you're able to capture, to the next level. 
Now a round brush like what I'm using here, you can use that one brush to create a few different brush type effects. So you could put a chisel point to it and use it a bit more like a filbert brush. But with a liner brush, they do have a specific use. So it's one of those brushes where it's really valuable to take that extra time to learn how to be a bit confident with it from the very beginning. Now there are a couple of things though to bear in mind when you are using a liner brush and this is going to come down to just practicing with it really. You'll find that there is quite a fine balance between how much water you need and how much paint you need in order to get the right consistency for the paint to flow off the bristles. So when you're wanting to create longer, finer lines, you're going to need to thin that mixture down a little bit more. If you use a liner brush and you find that you've got harsher stop and start points or you're starting to see the grain of the canvas showing through that's a really good indication that the paint that you've mixed is a bit thick and you need to thin it down with a little bit of water now if it goes the other way and appears too thin you'll need to add more paint to that mixture to thicken it up and what will happen is if it is too thin it will the, the paint will look very translucent so it will almost look like the paint is sort of beading up a little bit it's really it's hard to explain but once you've had it happen you will know then that it is far too thin if you can see through it and you can see it's too translucent that's a good sign that you need to thicken up that mixture now obviously if you are using this brush and the water and the details are actually running then you've got far too much water on that brush so it's a really fine balance now one big tip when I use a liner brush and I am thinning down that mixture I don't dip the entire brush in the water I will only put the very tip of that brush you know no more than a third that's that's the absolute most that I will submerge that brush in that water so that I don't end up transferring too much of that water to my mixture it's much easier to thin down your paints gradually because if you add too much water you're going to then have to use more paint in order to thicken it up and then you're going to end up mixing and using more of the paints than you originally intended so going back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the video where I have broken down each element into individual parts and this is how I tackle every single painting. So once I started with the nose, the muzzle, the top part of the head, I then did the ear. Once I've added the details here, I'm then going to go on to the chest. Now if you're finding that you're not achieving the desired outcome, maybe it's not as realistic as you would like, what can be happening is if you're trying to tackle the area and it's too large, we have a tendency to subconsciously rush it because we're working on a much larger area. So my biggest thing and the first thing that I would advise if that is happening is really scale down the area that you're working on. Just get an area about 80% complete and then move on to the area next to it. And that is certainly my preference. Now I find that when I work like that compared to doing set individual layers, I find that I am not only more motivated, but I also complete my work much more efficiently. Now that's not because I'm trying to paint quicker, it's just because where I've got each element up to 80% complete, I look back at that reference photo, look back at my painting and I can clearly see that my painting already looks like that dog and for me that keeps me motivated and then I find that I am far more effective with how I'm painting. Something else that can happen is, is sometimes you sit there at your easel and you stare at that reference photo because you don't know what bit to do next. That can also happen when you're working on a larger area. Again, if you've got one bit and you think that you have scaled it down enough, start split that bit in half again. So work on one, two square inches at a time. So I really hope this quick time lapse was of use with the few tips and techniques that I've mentioned here. I do have a Patreon channel where I've got pastel and acrylic tutorials all considerably slower and I also have a Patreon library on my website so that you can have a look at the tutorials available on Patreon before you join. So I will link my Patreon channel in the description below if that's of interest and if this video has been useful I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and if you'd want to get notified of future content hit the subscribe and the bell button and I'll be uploading another video here to YouTube next week.